A new report is drawing a link between a secretive white supremacist organization and an active duty member of the military. The story from ProPublica and Frontline identified a U.S. Marine who belonged to the neo-Nazi group Atomwaffen. But the connection between hate groups and the military is not new. A new book, Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America, charts the path of radical white supremacists from the end of the Vietnam War to the 1995 bombing of a federal government building in Oklahoma City. Joining me now is the author of Bring the War Home, Kathleen Ballou. Kathleen is also an assistant professor of U.S. history at the University of Chicago. Kathleen, thanks so much for Thank joining you us. For having me. First, I want to get your take on this article. I think a lot of Americans would be surprised to see that a active duty U.S. Marine was involved in some of the, the violence in Charlottesville. Apparently, allegedly, he bragged about it online. And we do have a response. I want to read quickly from the Marines saying the Naval Criminal Investigative Service has opened an investigation to determine the facts surrounding the allegation. Participation in extremist activities or organizations is inconsistent with Marine Corps core values. Second, MLG takes this allegation seriously and this matter is under investigation. So Kathleen, it doesn't really surprise you though that there is a connection here because that's what you've studied in your book, correct? Absolutely. And let me be clear first about the argument that I'm making about the effect of wartime on white supremacist groups and also the effect of veterans upon this movement. Um, I'm looking at a group um, of activists that is very radical in nature. It shouldn't be understood as simply white nationalists or patriotic because it's a group of people and a movement whose aim is fundamentally to overthrow the United States of America to set up a racial nation. They want a revolution. Yeah, this is fundamentally at odds not only with you know the principles of what it means to be American for many, many people, but also with the oaths of induction for groups like the Marine Corps and other branches of the service. And you sort of connect the dots between some activity that we've seen happening here in the U.S. over the mm -hmm. 70s, the 80s, and the 90s that have that has been looked at as sort of lone wolf. For instance, the Timothy McVeigh bombing in Oklahoma City. A lot of people said he acted as a lone wolf. But you make the argument that there's actually a timeline here and there's a connection. Certainly. So um, the McVeigh bombing is a, is a very good example of an act of violence that is clearly um, tied to earlier activism within this movement. So what I'm talking about when I talk about the white power movement is a paramilitary group of activists that band together across all regions of the country, across all genders, across all class brackets, across many different kinds of identities. Um, to foment radical activism beginning in 1979 and stretching into at least the Oklahoma City bombing. You start with a man named Lewis Beam, is yes. that right? Yes. Who is he and why is he connected to this? So Lewis Beam is a veteran of the war in Vietnam who served um, as a Huey helicopter gunner and then returned home to the United States and found different kinds of white supremacist activism. He joined um, a Klan group, he experimented with some other kinds of activism, and then eventually moved into to leadership in this broader white power movement. He's a person that, st that uh, pioneered a strategy in 1983 called leaderless resistance, which is what we know today as cell-style terrorism, right? It's the work of a group of fully committed activists working in a small cell without direct and prosecutable ties mm. to movement leadership. So that's deliberate. Indeed, and that is the model of activism that McVeigh was using when he targeted the Oklahoma City Federal Building. So it protects other members. Yeah, well, you know, it protects other members, but it also does some more pernicious things. It, it first of all protects the movement so that if one cell falls to infiltration or to prosecution, it doesn't take down the entire structure of the movement. But it also protects this entire kind of ideology from public awareness and from public understanding, mm -hmm. um, and also from the kinds of real policy changes that might deliver a different sort of response. Can you explain the thinking here? Because it, I think a lot of people would be surprised that ex-military, ex-U.S. soldiers would now be part of a movement that wants to overthrow the very government they once fought for. Exactly. And this is fundamentally opposed to, I think, what most people who give their lives in service for their country are trying to do. Um, it's a complicated historical question. Mm -hmm. If you look at surges in this kind of activism um, and vigilante activity throughout American history, or at least through the long 20th century, what we find is that vigilante violence correlates with the aftermath of war. Now, 
At first glance, someone might look at that and think it's about veterans. Actually, that's not the case. Violence rises through all segments of American society after warfare. So this is equally a problem among civilians, among women, among people who didn't serve. The problem is that it's instrumentalized and the violence is augmented by the veterans um, who do become involved and because they the have extent the knowledge, of their training. They have mm -hmm. the training and the military know-how. Training and tactics, access mm -hmm. to weapons. Um, in the period that I'm studying, people are actually stealing weapons from armories on um, military bases and posts and using the actual um, physical infrastructure of the war in Vietnam to wage war back home. Now, let's look at modern time. A lot of people are alarmed at what they see as the rise of some of these alt-right groups. Is it just that they're more visible now? Are they growing or are we simply noticing them more now? You know, one of the things we can learn from this history is that what seems new in the present moment is not new. We have had a lot of information about white power activity through the entire duration of the period of I st uh, that I study um, and on into the present. Everything that appears in this book was covered by journalists at the Times. Um, these events appeared on morning news magazine shows, mm -hmm. um, even on Saturday Night Live. So really the question is, what is the belief structure and the method of response and sort of the level of public education around this that allows these things to submerge and then resurface? And Kathleen Ballou, thank you so much. Thank you.